For the whole of spring, I will be theming my output around the illustrations of one James C. Christensen. And I like playing in other people's sandboxes, so this is what we're doing for spring. Surprise, bitch. <laughs> Listen, I know I said we were gonna do artwork inspired by James C. Christensen all spring, and we are. But you know what falls smack dab in the middle of spring? <laughs> April 13th, a most auspicious day in Homestuck fan communities, and unfortunately for all involved, I am making it everyone's problem on a yearly basis. Last year, when I started making these models, I, I began my tradition of redesigning characters and I started with my two favorite trolls, Karkat and Kanaya, and their weapons and hives. And as you can see, I've kind of gotten a lot better at the entire 3D pipeline, but I couldn't very well redesign the uh, same characters twice. That's repetitive and it would be really boring for me. Uh, so I decided to redesign a lesser fave who dies early on and for all intents and purposes absolutely fucking sucks. Uh, the unfortunately fashionable incel fascist fish guy Arid and Empora. <laughs> this is for two reasons. One, it was my friend's birthday really recently and Aridin is her favorite little grey guy, so I wanted to make a little dude for her. And two, I found his outfit concepts really fun and interesting, but the actual concept he has is so fucking basic. There's a lot to play with in regards to who he is as a character and how that would inform his dress sense, but all we really have in canon artwork is like a sweater with his Aquarius symbol on it, some stripy pants, a stripy scarf, purple shoes with teal detailing, a violet streak, and a cape. And we can do better than that as a society, I believe we can do more to emphasize his whole deal in a sartorial direction. However, uh, don't get it twisted. I don't like the stances he takes, and I think he genuinely sucks. Like, if he were real, I would not be making fan art of him, and I wouldn't agree with his in-canon takes on anything outside of one line in Open Bound where he talks about gender. Uh, however, he is very much a fictional alien fish bug creature, with interesting character aesthetics. I just think I should be able to play in the space of character redesign without being tarred with the brush of fascist sympathizer. I was honestly pretty worried about even doing this redesign presently, because people tend to conflate random ass internet Jews with the state entity of Israel and its heinous genocidal war crimes. I don't want to get into it more than this in this obviously very lighthearted video. So suffice it to say that I do not support the genocide of Palestinians in the name of creating an ethno-state for Jewish people, and let's just leave it at that and uh, move on. I am simply redesigning a character because his outfit could use a redesign, not because I agree with his fascistic incel rhetoric. End of discussion. I know it's hard, but please don't get anti-Semitic in the comments, thank you. Um, anyway, back to the topic of Arid and Empora. Um, canonical asshole who everybody hates. He's a powerful member of the nautical upper classes. His striped specimen is rifle kind, and he uses a fuck off huge harpoon gun looking thing called Ahab's Crosshairs, which I also modeled for this mini set. He murders a bunch of angels and like two people and the matriorb. I'm not even gonna get into what that is. 
because he's an entitled little baby piss boy and he gets chainsawed in half by absolute best girl Kanaya when she rises from the grave. Um, <clears throat> he's an overbearing history buff LARPer with a love of wizards and pirates and flamboyant fashions and using all of this information I think we can get started creating a new look for him. His costume has a few very distinct qualities that we're going to need to consider guiding lights in this redesign. Purple highlights, stupid melodramatic cape, blue and black striped trousers, periwinkle and navy striped scarf, fins, gold jewelry, violet and teal shoes, and that Aquarius symbol. As fun as they are, I wanted to remix them into an outfit that's a little bit more informed by his character. I was very inspired by military uniform jackets, especially this one which is a Hungarian Hussar cavalry jacket. I liked the cut and general vibe of the garment, but I wanted to play a little bit with the length and the hem shape, raising it slightly and creating a slight overlap to create that W-shaped hem as a nod to the Aquarius symbol. In keeping with this more historical fantasy fashion vibe, I replaced his basic bitch Sherlock energy scarf using the navy and periwinkle stripe motif for his jacket cuffs and a simple jabot cravat at the neck. The fastenings used in the original Hungarian design are repurposed here, shaped in the iconic Aquarius symbol and fastened with gold brooches. He's wearing a normal black top under the coat and has epaulets because let's be real here, he would have epaulets. For his breeches, I was considering a trunk hose breech. More popular in Western Europe around the same time the Hussars were doing their thing in Hungary. These are your more prototypical English Renaissance pants, and I love them. I think they're funny in any iteration. I kept the color combo of black and navy stripes along the puffier section, and made the hose a plain navy with silver stars as a motif throughout to tie him back to the sartorial traditions of fashionable wizard. The shoes are a simple violet and teal loafer with white laces. I didn't think Renaissance boots suited the color scheme that Aridin's shoes have, and figured the fanciest shoes that would fit his vibe were a formal spat, but that clashed too much with his fancier historical outfit, and also didn't seem super comfy to LARP in, so I split the difference and designed these more casual split color loafers inspired by spats. cape is fastened with two gold brooches linked by a golden chain around the chest and he has a ton of gold rings in his fins and on his fingers. I designed the fins as inspired by my ages old cosplay of Aridin from 2013, translucent in material with a pink to purple transparency gradient along the um, membrane with the bony structures in the same light grey as his skin. I gave him basic bitch glasses because I didn't want to distract from the overall flamboyance of the rest of the fit. Now that we have his basic design all figured out, let's get started modeling. I do my same cube to face to body approach that I do in all of my 3D modeling work, 
using my reference images as a guide to shape the planes of the face. This silhouette uses the illustrations from the S Cascade Flash and, and Pest Request as a reference. So I just kind of settled on the suggestion of a nose that I could then detail in the um, texture painting phase later on. To create horns, I grab a section of quads above the brow bone, in this case it's four quads, hit circle in the loop tool submenu, and extruded them outwards using my side profile as a reference to shape his horns. I added several loop cuts before going into sculpt mode to fix the shapes as necessary. To create the fins, I basically did the same as the horns. I grabbed three little quad squares, approximately three rows away from each other, going down the side of the face, and hit circle in the loop tool submenu to get rounded bases for each bony protrusion, and extend them outwards along the x-axis. Once they're at the desired length, I close the gaps between them by selecting the four corners on the end and hitting F to fill the vertices. I did this until I reached the innermost one, at which point I split these membranes using the loop cut tool so the vertex number on the membrane would correspond to the one on the foundation of the face and then filled them all um, as normal. After I'm done adding seams to the head, I get started on the body. You all see me do this a bunch of times by now. We just create a circular base at the bottom of the head, extend downwards, shape according to the reference, and keep it going until we reach the crotch region. We've gone over how I do legs and feet several times, so I'll just talk here a bit about the few corners I did cut on this model and why. I didn't bother with the pecs, and there are no pants layers for him, it's just torso into trunk hose with no nude option. This is partially because the character dies at age 14, and I didn't want to be accused of sexualizing a minor half my age. I don't think depicting the Ken doll-esque form of a character without clothing is inherently sexualizing, but I am also keenly aware that I'm a queer woman nearing 30, and I don't want to be called a pedophile by kids who barely know what the word means. To create his loafers, I started with the soles by duplicating the vertices at the bottom of the leg and ankle. I pulled the verts around until it looked like the bottom of a shoe, filling this shape in with quads and triangles as necessary, and subdividing it down the middle lengthwise. I then extruded upwards to create the base of the loafer, and corrected the shoe's sole's construction and form so it better resembled the way loafers looked. From then, I started to build out the top and profile of the loafer, referring to photos on my second monitor to get the look of the shoe right. I traced the tongue with the knife tool so I could cut protruding bits out later for the laces. I gave the loafers a more boot-like cut around the ankle, partially to hide the fact that his feet and ankles are essentially stumps, and partially because it fit the look of the outfit better.
After insetting and extruding the tongue and boot sections as necessary, I added the grommets for the laces by adding a few tiny toruses along each extruded boot edge. I had recently seen a tutorial on Instagram about how someone had modeled their chucks in Maya, so I did a similar thing with the laces, using planes and placing them so they appeared as though they went over the grommet and under the lacing structure, the way shoes generally look laced up, and then extruding them upwards for depth. I tried finding the reel, but it was frankly impossible to track down. I don't even remember the username of the person who posted it, but it was really helpful. Uh, sorry, sorry I can't source that. To make his arms is the same way I always do an extension. Shape the shoulders, grab 2x2 two two quad planes, hit circle in the loop tool submenu, and extrude them out horizontally, referring to the character sheets I drew earlier on until I hit the hands. Then I make a separate cube, hit it with a subdivide modifier, and model the hand, making extra sure I don't do anything to the base of the wrist. I, gi I give him nails to communicate that he doesn't work with his hands at all. I did this by insetting two by two quads on the top of each finger and on the side of the thumb, extruding them in and then outward and then forward to add a bit of length. Once they look the way I want, I apply the subdivision modifier, move them off to the side a bit so they don't touch in edit mode, and join it up to the main mesh using Control J, before resizing and bridging the vertices on the wrist and at the bottom of the arm. Both connection points have 9 vertices and should bridge with quads so the rigging will function properly. After quickly subdividing some cubes and scaling them down for epaulets, I started on his jacket. I duplicated the mesh from his neck to his wrists and about halfway down his torso and separated it off to create the jacket, bringing two verts down in the front to create the W hem of the crop jacket in the reference image. Some accessories are actually already done in this edit section because I had to remake the jacket. The weight painting on the original was a complete mess and didn't want to be fixed. I was manually painting it for a good two hours before I gave up with little to no progress, so I just cheated and duplicated things after I had parented the rig. Um, I applied the mirror mod, moved one side of the jacket to overlap with the other, and then I bridged the gap. The cape is just a plane that I shaped around his head and to create that iconic conical opening and extended down his shoulders to the floor.
And the hair is the way I always do it. Subdivided cubes just modeled around the head to approximate the reference image with a few stray curls using curves. I gave him a few out of place in the front because he always seems pretty stressed in the comic before he dies, um, and I think the few hairs out of place communicates that his seemingly perfect veneer is cracking a tiny bit as a result. To create his glasses, I added a subdivided mirrored plane, added a few horizontal loop cuts to shape the lenses, and one cut down the middle for the convex surface. After shrinking them and placing them on his face, I built the frames out from there, in setting the lens shape, extruding the temples, hiding the lens, and extruding the whole frame outwards. To make the bridge, I simply used a tiny cylinder that I modeled around the nose. The chain fastening his cloak is a pair of small mirrored planes just extruded out on the y-axis between two large round brooches on the cloak. This is because I'll be using alpha transparency to simplify the final process. I'm not really going to talk over the accessories too much, they're just basic shapes that I like extended or extruded or just put there. Like, those rings are really just Tauruses. I didn't do anything to them. His fancy cravat is just a subdivided mirrored plane that I pushed some loops in and out along the y-axis of to create ruffles. Duplicated it and put the smaller one at the top and the larger one at the bottom, placed just slightly off-center to fit between the collar of his jacket And that's the modeling step all done. I am especially happy with the shoes and the hands. I think those turned out really, really well. Now let's get to the rigging. So this is another slightly complicated rig, so let's get started with a diagram. In addition to the basic human meta rig, I'll be adding rigs for his two loose hairs, the collar and the cape of his cloak, and then both his fins.
This means the hierarchy for bone parentage will look something like this. Fins and hair bones will be parented to the head bone. And then the tip of each bone of the bony protrusions in the fins will be parented to the bone closest to the face on the next one up, like so. The cape will be rigged to the neck and shoulders, so it can mostly flap in the breeze. The collar bones will be parented around the base of the neck bone, and the long flap bones on either side will be parented to their corresponding shoulders. The middle back bone of the cape will be parented to the top of the spine bone chain. Now that the hard part of mapping out the rig is all done, we can get to the easy bit, the actual rig itself. Let's add a quick human meta-rig into the project, delete all the head bones, and make sure that everything is properly situated in the meshes. Just grab, scale, and rotate as necessary. Once you've got that looking nice, we can build out the new bones. It's all pretty straightforward. You just shift A to add all the bones that you want, label them, symmetrize, and then put them where they're needed. Once that's done, parent everything to the armature except eyes, lashes, brows, and non-animated hair. I always parent those to the head bone, so I don't have to do too much cleanup. <laughs> There's a bit of manual weight painting here and there that needs to be done, so we test out the extra bones and clean up the weight painting and vertex groups as necessary before testing poses and checking to see how it all works. Then I revert the pose to neutral and begin unwrapping and painting all the meshes.
This fits all pretty straightforward as well. Um, it's just a lot of painting, futzing with opacity and like shader jigging, you know, just coming up with ways to make specifically like the translucent stuff look right. I don't really have a ton to say about the process that I haven't already said in previous videos. I just really enjoy the process of texture painting. I find it very relaxing, but still challenging. I move between solid and material views a fair bit, so I can see which bits need to be like pushed and pulled forward with lighter and or darker colors because my textures that are plugged into the emission node look super duper flat if I don't. It's the same kind of process that goes into making a model like this, like a lot of the shading is all stuff I have to put in manually because otherwise it won't look dimensional. A strong foundation of basic color theory and like lighting is super duper helpful when it comes to stuff like texture painting because it's basically the same as if you were like painting a canvas or piece of plastic that you want to like emphasize the uh, texture on.
This is the point where I have to apologize, because OBS died on me in the middle of recording. I was able to salvage most of the footage, but some of my process was cut as a result. To make up for it, here's a short animation I accidentally created for the finalized rig when I was trying to grab some finished renders. Enjoy! I'm really, really pleased with this end result. I, I think it came out so extremely cunty and campy and awful, and for Aradin, that's kind of the best we can hope for, really. I think Ahab's crosshairs looks really, really good, and he looks really good holding it and posed with it. I think they really make a very good matching set, and they, in compositions, they work really well together. Anyway, that's all from me in my little Presidian dream bubble tower. I'll see you all in two weeks with the real character model that I'm supposed to be doing. I can't wait to show you all the actual magic that I've been cooking up for this April. Stay frosty, gang. I'll see y'all later. Bye!